it's not really the bipedalism that, that drives this. And I came to that conclusion because I looked at koalas. Hello, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Catalina Vijan Mil, who is an Associate Director of the Laboratory of Primate Morphology at the Caribbean Primate Research Center. So welcome, Dr. Vijan Mil. Could you please share a brief overview of your career and research? Of course. Um, so I did my undergraduate degree and my master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania um, in physical anthropology. I started out thinking I wanted to do genetics, but um, then found out I preferred to work with bones. Um, so I went on to do my PhD at New York University, um, where I did my dissertation on the evolution of the head and neck in primates. And after that, I was visiting assistant professor at Dickinson College for a year. And I'm originally from Puerto Rico, and I returned uh, shortly after that to teach anatomy. Uh, for about six years, and just last year, I started at the Caribbean Primate Research Center. Thank you. Uh, what would you consider your greatest research achievement or the accomplishment that you're most proud of? So I think um, in terms of research, what I'm most proud of is our work with vertebrae. Um, so there's a lot of vertebrae in any single individual. There's 20 something um, or 30 something, depending on, on how you count it. Um, so it's a lot. And most people who work with vertebrae, they'll work with one or two vertebrae from, from each individual or each species. And myself and my um, colleague, Emily Middleton, um, we were able to collect whole vertebral column data from hundreds of individuals. Um, and we've been able to learn a lot about how the vertebral column is evolving because of all this data that we've ever gotten. Um, so recently we had a couple of papers come out. Um, so in primates, uh, primates do all sorts of weird locomotor behaviors and especially humans. Um, we are very unique in the, in the mammal world. Um, because we walk upright, and um, so our entire vertebral column has been reconfigured. And there's a lot of hypotheses about why that is um, and how that happened. And um, we were able to look at the vertebral column in humans and some other primates. And um, what we found out is that a lot of the sort of underlying um, developmental and genetic processes that are affecting the evolution of the human vertebral column are very similar to those of macaques um, rather than to those of other hominoids like chimpanzees or gibbons. Um, and there's still a lot of work that we need to do. Um, and my colleague is extending that as well into the pelvis. So that'll be really exciting to see what's happening um, in the pelvis uh, in humans with the vertebral column um, compared to other primates. Uh, but I, it's, um, it's nice to see that you can uh, reinterpret um, that data and um, have new insights into what's going on. And it shows us how weird uh, the apes are, it seems. I think the apes are probably each doing their own little weird things separately. And we're just one of those weird little, weird little outbursts of that too. <laughs> and is there a lesser known historical figure in your field whom you particularly admire? Um, um, if so, what about their work uh, or life stands out to you? Um, so I was thinking about it and I don't know if there's a specific uh, person, um, but thinking back, evolutionary biology and developmental biology, all these fields, they're really young, right? Maybe, maybe a couple hundred um, years old, evolutionary biology, maybe 150. Um, and when you look back at a lot of the work of, of early people in the early 1900s, um, 1950s, you know, when we didn't even know what DNA was, um, they had a lot of insights. So people like Darcy Thompson, um, Olson and Miller, who um, wrote about and suggested uh, mor uh, morphological integration as a sort of um, uniting thing in animal traits. Um, these people had so little data. You look at these papers, it's, it's one specimen. Um, they're just kind of, oh yeah, this looks kind of different than this other thing. Um, 
So in general, um, you know, I just think they had such amazing insights given how limited their their access and their data was. So I think in general, I respect all of those people. I think they're, they're all really impressive. Um, I don't know if I can pinpoint one specific one. <laughs> and um, you've already briefly mentioned the macaques you've studied, but I was wondering if you could summarize the macaques of Cayo Santiago, um, their history and the major contributions to the field, uh, that this, this field site has made to primates research in general. Yes. Um, so Cayo Santiago um, is a little island off the eastern coast of Puerto Rico. Um, in 1938, uh, a guy called um, C.R. Carpenter um, brought about 400 macaques from India um, to populate this little island. At that time, um, people were starting to think about primates as a good sort of research model and biomedical model for humans, as well as a behavioral model. And it's when people really started going out into the field and trying to study primates. And they just kind of wanted a convenient primate colony for the United States. Um, so I don't know if it's the first, but it's one of the first um, primate colonies in the U.S. And it was founded with that purpose, right, to, to supply monkeys for, for all kinds of research. Um, the island was kind of left alone for, for a little while. And then in the 1950s, um, a new group of researchers came in and started doing a census and started collecting data every day on these monkeys. And a lot of the, the earliest studies we have on primate behavior and macaque behavior in particular come from these monkeys, um, which people were studying really intensely. And now we have something like 80 years of data on them so we can look at changes over time in their behavior. We can look at the effects of things like hurricanes um, and on their behavior, on their anatomy, on their physiology. So a lot of cool um, studies have come out recently. There was a huge Category 5 hurricane in 2017, and it, um, basically all the vegetation on the island died out, and obviously it's a very stressful time for us and the monkeys. Um, and tons of cool research has come out about you know, how that hurricane, this really stressful event has affected aging, how it has affected social behavior, um, physiology, and even um, there's several recent studies on how these hurricanes affect anatomy and fluctuating asymmetry and, and these kinds of developmental processes. And just a brief follow-up, Ben. It's, um, your research mainly focused on the skeletal remains from the these individuals. How, how far back does the, did they start collecting the skeletal? So um, they started collecting haphazardly in the 1950s. So we do have some individuals who died in the 50s or 60s, um, and it became much more systematic in the 70s. Um, so we do have uh, monkeys going back to 1950s up to the present day, but the bulk of it is really 70s, 80s, 90s, and now 2000s, yeah. Thank you. And then um, you've already mentioned your work on the vertebral column and the macaques, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on the methods you've used to study the vertebral column, um, particularly how you go about collecting the morphological data and how you carry out analysis of hearability um, that you've done in your research. Yeah, so um, to collect the data, I have something called a surface scanner. Um, and uh, the one I have actually looks kind of like an iron, like you would use for, for ironing clothes. And it's got different sensors. So it's got light and it's got uh, camera sensors. And you basically use it to go around whatever it is you're, you're scanning. And it measures the distance from um, the machine to the object and uses this to create a 3D model. Um, and once we have the 3D model, we can collect data on um, the, the shape of the model um, using something called landmarks. Um, where we place points on specific um, defined locations, and we can use that to measure overall shape or, or different linear measurements. Um, so we collected all these data on, on thousands of vertebrae, and um, the great thing about the Gallo Santiago monkeys is that we have pedigree data, so we know the moms of maybe not all, but certainly thousands of individuals um, from, from this little island from 1952 to the present. Um, so we're able to use the pedigree data in something called an animal model, which basically tries to estimate, you know, if you have two individuals that are related to X degree um, and they their anatomy is X similar, 
what is that discrepancy? And it uses that to estimate, you know, how much of the anatomy that we're seeing is really related to this underlying um, sort of genetic uh, variability. And we do this with hundreds of individuals at a time, so we can get a, a decent estimate of, of what that similarity is coming from. You've worked on other primate groups, um, including gibbons and fossil hominins. So I wonder if you could give a brief overview of that research. Yeah. Um, so a little while ago, now, um, we did work on fossil gibbons. Um, I did that work with Dr. Alejandra Ortiz, who I believe is at NYU right now. Um, and basically, as with most fossils, we have a very limited fossil record. Um, and most of that fossil record consists of teeth or other isolated elements. Um, so we really want to figure out ways to understand relationships between these fossils and living taxa. Um, using these very isolated elements. So we were looking at teeth. Um, our first paper was on a specimen that was attributed to Bunopithecus sericus um, from China, and it had um, uncertain dating. Uh, so we used uh, landmarks on pictures of the teeth to try to place it within the living gibbons um, and see what those relationships were like. And um, what we found is that Bunopithecus is its own thing, and it's probably most similar to, to Hulak gibbons. Um, and there's some distinguishing features of the anatomy of the teeth. Um, and then this later was expanded to include some other fossil specimens. Um, and then I've also worked on a sort of comparative anatomy, looking at humans, um, lots of primate species, and um, marsupials. Um, to understand sort of the evolution of the head and neck. Um, so when we look at hominin evolution, again, a lot of the fossils are cranial fossils, um, but one of the most important traits in hominins is that we're bipedal, um, so we're upright bipeds. Um, so a lot of effort has been expended trying to figure out whether we can tell whether something was bipedal just from its head. Um, and I was trying to figure out that out, like is bipedalism, um, head, and, head and neck posture, going to tell us what these guys were doing. Um, and what I found, um, for the most part, is, is that a lot of the changes that we associate with bipedalism in humans, um, they're associated more with sort of facial size and facial carriage um, than bipedalism per se. So when we look at fossils like Sahelanthropus, you know, this thing kind of looks like maybe a chimp or a gorilla, right, in terms of its face. Um, and it's been totally reconstructed. Um, so it seems very unlikely that it would have had this sort of biped-like frame and magnum with a more chimpanzee-like head, because it's not really the bipedalism that, that drives this. And I came to that conclusion because I looked at koalas. And um, koalas are upright. They they're actually described as not moving at all. Um, and when you compare them to, to kangaroos, um, you actually find the opposite, uh, and to kangaroos and wombats, um, you find the opposite pattern that you find in primates. So in primates, um, humans, um, supposedly more bipedal, things with little faces, right? They have these four frame and magnum that, that looks like the human frame and magnum that's more interior, more inferiorly oriented. Um, but when you look at marsupials, um, the position of the frame and magnum and the orientation of the frame and magnum is associated with the face, but it's not associated with posture. So koalas do not have um, what you would expect um, if it really was associated with posture. Um, and I, I looked at different factors affecting integration of the head um, and found some cool sort of um, roles of development and timing and maybe even body size. But that that all, that's there's a lot there to do. So. What, what made you like first think of studying marsupials as a comparison with the humans in the, you know, comparing with other primates? What, what made you first? consider studying them? Yeah, so um, like, I, like I mentioned before, right, one of the weird things about humans is that we're upright bipeds. And actually most mammals do not do this. There's only a few bipedal groups. Um, there's a couple of bipedal mice um, and kangaroos famously. 
and then we have koalas, which are which are upright, but they're not not bipedal. Um, mice are really difficult to study because they're really tiny and they have um, these big. They're called bolas, so they're like kind of inflated balloon-like structures underneath the head. Um, so they're very different from primates in that. Um, so marsupials, which have bipeds, they have orthograde um, upright. Um, species and they have quadrupeds seem like a good comparison for primates. Um, and then I also actually looked at carnivores. Um, I looked at meerkats. So they meerkats are also upright for a significant amount of time. Um, and they have close relatives, which are the mongooses, which are um, not upright at all. But unfortunately, there's actually no behavioral data to, to back up this idea that, that meerkats are upright, even though we see them being up all the time. So just um, another, but I'll start with the bipedal question for the next round. So these three questions are all going to be quick fire ones. So I'll start with the bipedal okay. ones since um, we've been speaking about it. So what do you think were the main driving forces behind the evolution of bipedalism in hominins? That's a big one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think probably they they just had to go long distances maybe they had to carry stuff you know the environment was changing and and they just had to do lots of different things and i'm not sure that early hominins were really obligately bipedal they were probably doing a lot a big variety of, of things thank you and um how important do you think hybridization has been in uh, during primate evolution yeah, so um, we know it happens all the time, and I, I think it's probably been really important, maybe partly in terms of um, genetic exchange, right, um, including new variation in different groups, but also just in terms of differentiating um, different groups and driving sexual selection for different traits, especially when you look at things like um, uh, vervet faces or colubine faces, all these monkeys that live together. And outside of primates you've studied so far, is there a species or group you would really like to work on in the future? And if so, what draws you to them? I think I would like to go back to carnivores um, because uh, there is just a big variety in size and behaviors. You know, we have bears doing all sorts of things. We have animals that are really restricted, like cats and dogs. We have the mongooses. Um, I just think they, they diverge into a, a lot of different um, sort of niches, and I think it would be interesting to explore that. Thank you. So this final question is um, always beyond academia or beyond the, your research. Um, so I thought I'd ask you about your experience as an associate editor of the Journal of Human Evolution and how you would like to see academic publishing evolve in the field over the coming years. Yeah, so um, I was associate editor for a couple of years. Um, I worked mostly with the editors in chief um, and of course the authors. Um, I actually really enjoyed it. I had a good experience. Um, I think because the editorial board and the editors in chief, there was a really united purpose in trying, you know, to, to really help people get their work out and make it as good as possible for the field, um, no matter how long it takes or how many revisions or or how much you really have to, to do to get it to that place. You know, there's a real commitment, it's a real service to, to get good work out there. Um, so I had a really good experience working with, with that team. Um, and in terms of publishing generally, you know, I think it's it's so important to have um, and to focus on things like society journals or um, more sort of community uh, control journals where the emphasis really can be on just getting good science out there and not worrying so much about publishing X number of papers each year or getting through specific timelines to publish those papers, which is a lot of the tension between these these for-profit publishers and sort of the academic community, right? Because they just want to get things out quickly, and we want to be able to work from the with them, and you know, get feedback and give feedback to to our peers, and just have good science out there. So I think I would like to see more movement towards these sort of society journals or community journals, where where the academic community is actually in charge of what's what's happening. Much for doing this interview. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. 
Likewise. Thank you so much for having me.